So my name is Adam. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, I'm super excited to see all of you. We are in Second Peter, and we're finishing that up today on our sermon series called Authority. Um, and I think it's been a really beautiful sermon series, at least in my heart, because we've kind of walked through what does authority look like in our lives. And it's something that every Christian has to to know and has to look at because we are inundated with information like never before. Inundated. There is constantly someone telling us who we are and what we need to be doing and where we need to be going and what clothes we need to be having and what food we need to eat, what food we shouldn't eat, what's good for us, what's bad for us, and the like. Amen? That was like one scroll through Facebook. Everything. Bang, 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 bang. And then you hit the news and the Twitters and the YouTubes and the newspapers and the books and the music and the ads, so on and so forth. So our sermon series really has been, all of those things are not bad. As much as I harp on them, they're not all bad. They can actually be really good. But how can we differentiate the good and the bad as Christians? Like, what are we allowing in our lives to be authoritative in telling us what to do and where to go and what to dress and and how to eat? How do we do that? Well, the sermon series has done a pretty good job of saying, look, we're going to take it and we're going to look at it through a biblical lens. We're going to put it up against what the Bible has to say. And if there's something that is clear and apparent in our hearts, then we're going to go with what the Bible has to say. Now, there's some things the Bible's just not going to talk about. Like, I don't know, whether salt's good for you or not. Ten years ago, salt was good, salt was bad. I like salt, so I'm going to keep putting on my food. Jesus said I could do that. Amen? Salt's good, right? But there's a lot of other things in which we have to start looking at things through the biblical lens. Like, does this rhyme or does this line up with what the Bible says? And so last week, Tim taught out there are some people who will teach and preach the Word of God even though it's not what the Word of God says. And so Simon Peter is going to continue to discuss what they call heretics or someone who preaches something that is outside of the gospel. He's going to continue that on in chapter 3, and that's where we're going to go. But before we get there, I want to explain the heresy in which our heretics are preaching in the church in Asia Minor. So there's two gentlemen, and it's been 30 years since Jesus has died. He was resurrected, and he walked out of the grave, like we just sang, right? died, resurrected, walked out of the grave, ascended into heaven. And they came out about 30 years after that and said, hold up, hold up, hold up. We're brilliant. We know what happens in life. There's a natural progression. It's happened from the beginning of time. You're born, you live your life, you die, and you go somewhere. You go to a grave, you go to a mausoleum, you get burned up and, you know, whatever they call that thing. You're going somewhere. But we haven't seen anybody not go somewhere. Like, we haven't seen anybody get up and and walk away. There's a natural progression. It's science, Simon Peter, church in Asia Minor. You have to understand this. Like, and it should make sense, right? We're all relatively intelligent people in this room, right? And we look at science and we say, hey, well, there's life and there's death and it happens. And uh, we don't see any of this resurrection thing. Does it make sense? Can I get a head nod? Like, it makes sense, right? That's, that's how science works. And so they're teaching this. So it doesn't seem like a big thing. Well, if Jesus doesn't, Resurrect, does that really matter? How does that affect the gospel? Let's run through it just logically and we'll see just how bad this is if we teach it. So we believe that Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, came down from heaven. He took his robes of majesty off and he put on flesh that was broken and it was damaged. He became human. So God himself came human. He lived 33 perfect years empowered by the Spirit. 
And when he got up on that cross and they drove nails into his hands and into his, his feet, he didn't just suffer a physical death. We believe as Christians, it's one of our tenets of faith, is that he actually took the wrath of God for our sins. And so if you're a Christian in the room, Jesus on that cross said, God, there is going to be a wrath that comes down and you're going to put it on me. I'm going to become sin so that they won't be sin. Now we also know that the penalty for sin is death. God defined that out in His Word. If you sin, there has to be a death. Okay? So if Jesus took all of our sins on the cross and he died because that was the penalty, then the only way that death could be defeated or sin could be defeated is if he rose again in a bodily form. And so if Jesus never rises, then we never have salvation. And all of this is just a big waste of time. Because we are still sinful in God's eyes and we will still be judged at the end and sent into eternal damnation. That's that's how quickly this heresy can turn our gospel or the good news into nothingness. So when we sing that Jesus walked out of the grave, what we're really saying is, is that sin has been defeated and I have life now. Because without that, I'm still dead in my trespasses. It's hugely important. But yet when we look at it through a scientific lens or something we can observe, it doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal. And that's where Simon Peter is going, hey, stop it. Stop it. Don't listen to this. Because there's an authoritative scripture that says this had to happen this way in order for you to have life and to teach it any differently is heresy. And it's teaching people not the gospel. It's not pointing to Jesus. It's pointing to the natural flow of things. It makes sense. 33 or 30 years after Jesus died, he showed himself to some 500 people. And there were two, two goons that were like, hold up. I'm smarter than y'all. Let me preach this. And so we might go, all right. Well, that was what Peter had to say. And Simon Peter had to say to the church some 2,000 years ago. But we deal with the same thing today. In fact, I was reading an article here just recently from a, uh, from a minister. Her name is Lydia. She's at a church in California. And, uh, and, and this is what I'm talking about in terms of authority. Have you, ever got, have you guys ever gone on the internet and you started to read something that you thought was really interesting? And then you clicked a link and then you read another blog article that linked to another blog article that linked to something like this, and pretty soon you're like four hours deep, and you're like, what? I started off on this one article, and now I've gone down 37 rat trails, and like, I never know what's going on. I want everybody to shake their head and like verify that they've done that, so I'm not the only one, right? And so I ended up reading this, this blog article from Lydia, and, and she was talking about the, the history of the, what they would call liberal theology or the liberal church. And she started off, I think her history was really good. She said, um, we had this orthodox Christianity and we hit enlightenment. Then we started to think we were smarter than everybody. We, science became hugely important in mathematics and uh, philosophy. And uh, we see all of the arts in which have really defined out what our culture. Uh, we saw them collide during the enlightenment. Like, and it was an ugly collision. They said, your orthodoxy is stupid. Your Bible is dumb. It's archaic. It's an old book. It really wasn't meant to be anything other than maybe some boring literature that you read to go to sleep. It doesn't hold any weight to our science. Sound similar? And so this same thought process has continued to purvey into the church all the way up until now. It's what we end up in with, with liberal theology. And so I want to read this to you, and I I really want you to just kind of hear just how easily we can go down the wrong path. Lydia says this when she's juxtaposing the the Orthodox Church or the the Bible-believing church with what the liberal church believes. She says, whereas the liberal Christian church has already already made amends with understanding biblical stories as allegorical cultural narratives. 
and true myths that conveyed human nature and divine values. New conservative movements attempted to reinscribe them as pure and simple historical fact. And so what she's saying there in her rather large language is simply this. When we were confronted with what the Bible said, we couldn't take and separate from what nature and science said. And so we had to say, you know what? The Bible is actually nothing more than the allegorical stories that you tell your children so that they'll be good people. There's no power in it. There's no fact in it. It's not a historical account. What it is, what it comes down to, is just a story about being good or being bad. And if you try to put any emphasis on its truth or its authority, you're a moron. That's what she said. She said, we don't need the Bible as an authoritative source. We have science and our intellect. Which I find is fascinating. Because I know I'm not the smartest dude in the room. But every time that I think I'm right about something, generally I'm maybe like 50% right, right? Like if I think about all the knowledge in the world and and everything that the Bible goes through and maybe everything that I know, I'm not really all that bright. In fact, we could take it back to the food conversation, right? 20 years ago, salt was bad for you. But now salt's good for you. Eggs are now apparently bad for you. I don't know. I like eggs. So how authoritative is science in terms of nutritional science? One guy says this thing and one guy says that thing. What's true? Amen? Yeah. Let's think about all of the other sciences. We all have a bunch of theories. How much of it is concrete that we know absolutely for 100% that it is true, regardless of anything? And I love the science. I love all of the sciences, but they're all theories. And they all have these little hitches to them. They all have outlying data that just doesn't quite fit our theories to prove it. But not the Bible. And so that brings us to the big idea today. Heresy began in the garden, because Peter's going to take us back to the garden as he walks this out with a whisper. It is in the smallest whispers that we find ourselves being led astray. Because I don't believe that spirit-filled Christians are running to the massive heresies in the world, flocking to them right and left. I think the biggest danger to the church in the heresy realm is that small little voice that says, Hey, is this really true? And so we take a little half step away off that narrow path. And we start to listen to the things that are not authoritative and we don't bring them back to the Bible because we we don't actually want the Bible to inform us. And pretty soon we're so far off the path that just like these two gentlemen preaching that there was no resurrection, we've completely distorted the gospel, not in our heart, not just in our hearts, but to everyone that's around. Second Peter. Chapter 3 starts off this way, verse 1. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. So he's talking to the church. Anytime you see beloved, he's saying, I'm talking to you Christians. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through the apostles. Knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. So Simon Peter, right off the bat, is going to address our problem, because I just laid out a really big problem for the church, and he's going to address it. He's going to say, I already had the solution, church. It's real simple. I want to stir up your sincere mind by the way of reminder of what the Bible has to say and the truths in which the Bible presents. It's sitting on a hill we call this gospel fluency. 
See, we believe so much in the gospel, we believe so much in the word of God that we want it to drench every word that comes out of our mouths and every action that we take in our lives so that we become a picture of the gospel to the world. The only way we're going to do that, though, is if we're in community and we're continually reminding ourselves, like Simon Peter is to the church, what the truths of the gospel are. Because if you're like me or like anyone else, we'll quickly forget and we'll run to the newest self-help medium blog article that you read and say, this is the authority of my life now. But if we're continually in community and we're continually reminding ourselves of the truths and the love of Jesus Christ and what he has done in our lives, we will continue to address the problem of heresy in the church and in the community. Because what will happen is, is as our words and our actions become just entrenched in the gospel, is we will display the true gospel, the powerful gospel, the real gospel into the world, and they will see the heretical gospel for what it is. Because I believe that the majority of the people in this world can recognize heresy for what it is. Just this week, a pastor had asked his church to raise $54 million so he could get his third plane. His third plane, his third jet. And of course the world went, what? Jesus is on the cross, he said, you bear up on the cross and you want a $54 million jet because God only hears you when you're on on your private plane? No! But if they see the authentic church, if they see the church empowered by the Spirit, driven by the Word of God, loving the unloved, giving into the poor, coming to the needs of the community, bringing forth the love and the joy of Jesus, they're going to say, that's authentic. That's real. I'll be a part of that But I'm not going to be a part of this dude who's over here saying, I need $54 million for a jet. It doesn't make sense. And so Simon Peter right off the bat says, we need the gospel in our lives more than anything. And so the challenge here, church, is that if you ever hear the gospel being preached in this building or out of the building, are you willing to come forth and saying, hey, let me show you or tell you what the real gospel says? Like, do we know the gospel well enough to where we can say, hey, that's not quite right. Let me lovingly show you how that breaks down the the tenets of our faith or the beauty of the gospel. Can we... Can we have that conversation? Because just as Simon Peter is doing in here lovingly, he's not just outwardly saying, you're wrong. We don't want to play in this camp. We want to take our ball and we're only going to play over here with the reform side of things. That's what the church has done. Or we only want to play in the Lutheran side of things. Or we only want to play in the Southern Baptist side of things. Can we take the tenets of our faith, the life, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ, And we come together and see the glories of Jesus Christ even more. We sing about it. We preach about it. We talk about it. Do we want to see the fullness of Christ every day more in our lives so that we can show the fullness of Christ more in everyone, to the community in our lives? That's what Simon Peter is saying. But he knows this isn't easy. He knows that there's going to be some... Some talk back. So in verse 4 he says this. They, the heretics, will say, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing the way they were from the beginning of creation. So he's, he's giving them, he's telling the church, this is what they're going to say. Look, there's a natural order, a progression of things that are supposed to happen. Life, death, and you're dead. Like you end up in the grave or a mausoleum or maybe in some ashes somewhere. That's it. I'm going to give you the argument. And Peter says this. For they, the heretics, deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. 
and that by means of these, the world that had existed in deluge with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. And so what Peter's saying, he's going to take us back to the garden. He said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what was there before the heavens and the earth? There was God. And there was this formless void, water. And God started to create things with his word. He spoke into existence the air that you breathe. He spoke into existence the water that we drink. He spoke into existence the land that we sat on. He spoke into existence all of the animals that we eat because they're good for meat. He spoke into existence uh, everything in this world. The heavens and the earth. His word is powerful. His word has defined the world. His word has defined the natural sciences. His word has defined all of the observable things that we can understand through all of our brilliant intellect. His word. It's authoritative because it is the creation. But then if we take that same action and we go, in John 1, we learn just how big Jesus is. Because in John 1, he says the word became flesh. The logos became flesh. He was with God and he was God. And that word logos, that word is Jesus. And so we find out that God created the heavens and the earth and all of the story through Jesus and by Jesus and for Jesus. That it's in Jesus' name that all of that power came out. And it's in Jesus' story that we all live as Christians because the scoffers have one thing right. We're not seeing the fullness of God. He hasn't come back to judge the living and the dead. And that's what Peter is saying. It's in that word, all things were created and all things will be judged. We haven't seen that yet. But we saw the initial when Jesus was resurrected. And so church, here's the importance of this is if it's true that Jesus hasn't come back to judge the living and the dead as he has promised, that that means as Christians, you have been written into Jesus' story. And if Jesus came down to glorify the Father, to give the good news of salvation to broken sinners who had fallen away, enemies of God, And we believe the word of God, Matthew 28. And he says, look, you're part of my story. And I want you to go out and continue to preach the word of God. Continue to make disciples that make disciples. Continue the mission that I started. And I'm going to empower you by the same spirit that I was empowered. If that's true, then our lives should look radically different. Radically. Because we now understand that the power is in the word, the authority is in the word, and that power and authority has been given over to us in Christ Jesus. And by the giving of the Spirit and the indwelling of the Spirit, now we have the power to go out into the world and to preach a gospel in which God will come in and He will move into the hearts of people and they will be saved. It's the reality. And it's beautiful. But Simon Peter knew that there was going to be another problem that he was going to have to face. And he starts that off in verse 8. He says, Do not overlook this fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Now I want to make a little quick side note here. This verse has been used all over the place to try to decide whether the creation story was really just seven days or whether it was 7,000 days or 7 million days or however that is. City on a Hill, we believe that the creation narrative is absolutely seven days just as it is written. It is a historical account. It's open-handed. 
But in terms of this verse, we believe what really Simon Peter is saying here is that throughout the entire expanse of time that God created time and he is in our time, but he exists through all of time. And so into eternity, what's a year? What's a day? A thousand years? Who cares? It's eternity. What's a thousand years? Does it matter? It's eternity. It's a day. So in God and understanding the glorious, beautiful, just the amount of the, the, the greatest thing of God in this is that we cannot understand just how far and how fathom this reaches. Like we can't. Can you understand eternity? Of course not. But we can't even understand 15 minutes of the day. You're going to go home and argue with your wife, and you're going to check me back down on it. Go like, yeah, I really didn't understand 15 minutes of the day. But God understands all of time. And so Simon Peter says this. He says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness. All you brilliant people out there, it's been 30 years. But is patient toward you not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So when you take a look at that and you read those words, you go, the Lord hasn't come back because it is the will of God that all will be saved and I recognize that some will not repent and turn back towards me. But he hasn't come back because there's myriads of people who haven't heard the gospel. The loving father that has said, I loved you when you were enemies, says, I'm not coming back. Jesus says, I'm not coming back until all have heard the gospel that saves. It's for your sake that I haven't come back because I want you. I love you. You are mine. And when that starts to permeate our hearts, when it starts to infect our hearts, when the gospel becomes alive in our hearts, we recognize that there are people that are out there that are living, that are enemies of God who will be burnt up like the chaff and thrown into the lake of fire if they do not repent and turn towards God. But God, being rich in mercy, has sent you on that mission to give them the gospel. To give them the gospel. Is that the ringing of our hearts? That we thank God that he hasn't come back so our neighbor down the street can hear the gospel. The true authentic gospel. Because it would be easy for us, church, to slip into the we hang at the Bible belt. We're like the Bible, we're like the buckle of the Bible belt. Man, there's more churches than there are McDonald's. But if people haven't heard the true, authentic gospel, then they would be believing a lie. And Jesus is saying, I'm sending you out in authority to bring the truth, the authoritative truth in people's lives. But I want you to be awake. I want you to be a woke church. In verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. It's going to come quick. No one knows the time or the place, so you can throw all those heretical, you know, blood moon books out the window. They've all been false. Jesus hasn't come back. Stop selling the books. Stop buying the books too. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and its works that are done will be ex exposed. It's just the reality that Jesus is coming back. But he wants his people in Christ. Because when that happens, when the heavens and the earth roar and they're opened up and their fire and the brimstone come down and we start seeing things go ballistic, it will be more than we can ever imagine. 
God the Father looks upon you, Christian, and sees the perfect Son. He says, I see Jesus Christ. The blood covers over you. I'm passing over you in all of this. And you will spend eternity with me forever and ever. And that is the reality in which all people who have believed the gospel will have. That God looks upon you. He sees his son. And his judgment is passed over you. Because his judgment was already carried out for you by Jesus on the cross. So how does that cause us to live? Luckily, Simon Peter wrote this out, so it hits just there. Verse 11, he says this. Since these things are thus to be dissolved, it's going to happen. What sort of people ought you be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the come of the day of God, because by which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. So I want to take out verse 11 and 12 and just walk this through on a very biblical level. He says, since these things are going to be dissolved, the world's going to be dissolved, all of our natural understanding is going to be dissolved, eventually all of the things that we hold dear will be dissolved because they are like wheat and chaff burned and the only thing that will be allowed to continue is the truth and the word of God. Does everybody kind of understand that? Like all of the things that we read that we're, are going to make our days better and our lives more entertaining, that's all going to be going away when Jesus comes back. It's all about Jesus. Amen? Like watch your TV shows. I like my TV shows. Watch your NBA games. I like LeBron. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. That's what he's trying to say here. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Enjoy them. They don't matter. But you ought to live by holiness and godliness, waiting for the coming of Jesus and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved. What what Peter is saying to his people is, listen, God has promised that he will come back when every man, woman, tribe, and tongue in the world have heard the true and authentic, authoritative word of God. He will come back. Now, this can be taught in two different ways. It can be taught that we have a light switch, that as soon as everybody hears the word of God, he's going to flip it on and he's going to come back and we're going to get the new heavens and the new earth. But God is sovereign and God is in control and that is not the reality. What he is saying is that God hears our prayers and hears our hearts and sees our works and he, is, he wants to see us working hard for his name. He wants to see us patient and going out and conveying the gospel in appropriate ways. He wants us to see and he wants to see our hearts that we actually care about the people outside of this building. He's saying, listen, I hear your prayers and I see your works and I gave you your faith and I'm going to continue to make you look more like my son and give you more power and more authority into the world and I am coming back. That's the reality. There will be a new heavens and there a new earth. This earth is going to get fired up and dissolved. It won't be here forever. I'm redeeming it and bringing it back. So, the most important thing in your lives has to be the most important thing. And that is Jesus. Because if you're worried about all of the other things and your anxiety is high and you can't seem to figure out life's problems and everything is going ballistic in your life, there is going to be one constant. There is one purveyor of ultimate joy. There is one bringer of peace. There is one bringer of love. It's not the 36,000 books on the self-help section. It's Jesus. He is the authority. 
But God does seem to move throughout all of Scripture when His people are obedient and in the hearts have changed. And so I want you to hear this. So when we hear of missions going out into the world and, and people that are going out into unreached people groups, it's because that's the call of the Christian life is to send out missionaries for every tribe and tongue. That doesn't mean that Zimbabwe takes precedence over northern Jefferson County. What it means is, is our resources and our lives have to start stacking up to make sure that people hear the true, authentic gospel. And it starts with discipleship in your homes, and it builds in discipleship in your DNA groups, and it continues in discipleship in missional communities, and then it goes to discipleship in an even greater expanse into the church. But if we don't do discipleship well and preach the gospel to each other well, then this whole thing is going to continue to go out further and further. Because the reality is, is the gospel changes lives. It brings dead people to life. And so we want to hasten the coming of the day of the Lord. Because according to his promise, we are waiting for the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. And there will be no more pain and no more crying. And there will be no more suffering. There will be no more sin. It will be perfect harmony as it was in the garden. And so Peter leaves us with some final words. He says, therefore, church, since you are waiting for these, because it's not here yet, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Do the work of the disciple. Do the repentance to God. Look towards your relationship with God as the most important thing. Come forth and and allow people to pray with you and for you. Scripture tells us that when we come before God, we are washed white as snow, without spot, spot or blemish. May that be of first importance. And in that we will find peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our brother Paul has wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him. As he does in all of his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. Everything that Paul writes is the gospel. And he's affirming that Paul's writing, which is 75% of the New Testament, is in the same authority as the Old Testament, just as Simon Peter had made reference to in Simon Peter, or in 2 Peter chapter 1. And he says, look, and this, I really find this verse beautiful because it makes me feel not so dumb. He says, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. Like why Paul has to write run-on sentences everywhere. which the ignorant and the unstable twist to their own destruction as they do with other scriptures. Because the reality, church, is is that the heresies that we're going to battle, whether it's our own personal little heresies because we got dragged off, the whisper took us one step off the path, or it's the big heresies that still claim Christ, is they all take the scripture and they all start to form it to what they want it to say. And you heard that from Lydia. Ah, don't want to wrestle through the scriptures so we'll make it allegorical. It's just a good story to teach you some good and the bad. Ah, we don't like it that Jesus says, take up your cross. So we're only going to preach about the money and the glories and the heavenly wealth. Ah, we can't really explain a virgin birth and the dead man walking and showing himself. So we're going to run to natural sciences. It's just a small whisper. And yet it has grave consequences. You therefore, beloved, 
knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. Discipleship brings stability. Stability brings stable community and loving community and faithful community and communities that will go out and show the light of the family of God and redeem family in a very broken world. but grow in grace, church, in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen.